We are so excited to have you online with us to learn more about asylees or some people uh, view asylum seekers today. <clears throat> For those who aren't familiar with COVA, um, just a very quick plug that we do training for victim advocates. We also have an internship program to place folks from underrepresented, underrepresented communities in victim advocacy jobs, and we respond to mass casualties, among other things. So if anyone wants to know more about us, please feel free to visit coloradocrimevictims.org. With that, I am so excited to be here with Ndeya Ndao from the International Rescue Committee. And she's going to tell you a little bit about herself and we'll go ahead and get going. And as I mentioned, any questions, go ahead and uh, type it in the box and we'll get those answered for you. All right, thank you so much, Karsten, for having me and thank you all for connecting to the webinar and trying to learn more about the Thaili Outreach Project. Uh, so my name is Nadei Nadal and I work at the International Rescue Committee as the Asylee Outreach Coordinator and I've been working there since December 2019, no, 18, and working on a project called the Asylee Outreach Project. So if you haven't heard about the Asylee Outreach Project, I will be talking about it and also sharing more information about resources and services and benefits that asylees and other populations may be eligible for. So the Asylee Outreach Project is an outreach effort to basically connect asylees throughout the state of Colorado with information, benefits, and services. So the Colorado Refugee Services Program is the state agency that we are working on, working with in collaboration with the African Community Center and Lutheran Family Services Rocky Mountains to work collaboratively to identify gaps in communication and gaps in service access. So I am conducting outreach efforts in certain key communities throughout the state. So in Northern Colorado, the Western Slopes, uh, Southern Colorado, and also the ski resort areas where we found that there are some pockets of immigrant population where possibly there are some asylees in those, in those areas. So the, it's called the Asylee Outreach Project, but it also involves or includes refugees, victims of trafficking, Cuban Haitian entrants, Afghan and Iraqi special immigrant visa holders, as well as Amerasians. So these services and benefits uh, are available for those different populations. So I will be trying to cultivate during this whole project, trying to cultivate relationships and maintaining relationship with service providers throughout the state to be able to share that information so they can relate that information to the different populations that are eligible for those services. So I will be doing community information session for asylees as well as service providers and also asylum seekers to at least share that information for them so once they are granted status, they are able to connect with the state coordinator who will refer them to an agency to start receiving services. Uh, I am doing regular outreach and relationship building throughout the state, especially in the Denver area and also um, Grayley, Fort Collins, Colorado Springs, in the surrounding areas to at least share that information. And awesome. You know, I should have mentioned in the beginning, uh, you should have four handouts in the control pane of your webinar. You can go ahead and down, make sure you download those while we're here on the webinar so that you'll have access to those. And as well, this webinar will be on COVA's YouTube channel, which is COVA789, I believe, uh, within about two to three business days where you can um, rewatch it or share it with folks who weren't able to join us here today. All right, great. Thank you. So during this presentation today, we're going to talk about who asylees are, uh, what the population, what the asylee population looks like here in Colorado, and the types of services provided and how those asylees can access those services. Now, according to the United States uh, Citizenship and Immigration Services, they define an asylee as an alien in the United States or at a port of entry who is found to be unable or unwilling to return to his or home country because they are seeking protection of that country because of a well-founded fear of persecution. 
Now, persecution or the fear thereof must be based on the person's race, religion, nationality, membership in a particular social group, or a political opinion. So the last part uh, with the persecution or the fear thereof must be based on the alien's race and religion, nationality, and so on and so forth. That also applies to the definition of a refugee, which on the next slide, we'll talk about the differences between an asylee, refugee, and an immigrant. Awesome. Now, an asylee is someone who requests asylum in the United States, and the person may have entered the U.S. as a student, a tourist, a businessman, or someone who is undocumented. Now, once they enter the U.S. with one of those statuses, they submit an affirmative asylum application or a defensive application. Now, they can apply for work permit once the asylum is approved, except in some rare cases or occasions. Now, the individual is not eligible for refugee services if the application is pending. So individuals have to be granted status first, so asylee status, before they can receive services from the resettlement agency. Now, a refugee, according to the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugee, they define refugee as someone who has been forced to flee his or home country because of persecution, war, or violence. Now, the individual also has a well-founded fear of persecution because of reason of race, religion, nationality, political opinion, and the membership to a particular social group. Now, the refugee requests protection while overseas, so outside of the home country. So they fled their home country and went to another country, and from there, they apply um, or request protection and they are given permission to enter the U.S. as a refugee. So once they're in that other country of refuge, that's where they apply to become refugees. And once they granted that status, then they're resettled to the U.S. or other countries that uh, allow refugees there. So while there, they must contact an overseas office of the United States Citizenship and Immigration Services, USCIS, or the United Nations High Commissioner for Re Refugees and apply for that status. Awesome. Now, an immigrant, on the other hand, is someone who comes um, from another country, so they leave their country of origin and then come to the U.S. for, you know, hopes of a better living, for school or for business or just for other reasons. So they don't necessarily have that fear of being persecuted in their home country if they were to go back. So these individual immigrants, usually they are able to go back to their home country without having any repercussions, whereas Asylees and refugees, they're fleeing their home countries because of something going on in their country, war or persecution, so they cannot go back there. Now, for asylum, individuals can uh, apply either defensively or affirmatively. So with the affirmative asylum, the individual can apply when they are not in removal proceedings. So if the asylum is not granted and the applicant does not have a lawful immigration status, they are referred to the immigration court for removal proceeding. So individuals who apply affirmatively, usually they are not in removal proceeding and they are either here legally or undocumented individuals. And once they apply, they can renew the request through defensive process. So if the affirmative application is denied, they will apply for a defensive application. So the individual is, when they apply for the defense of asylum, the individual is in removal proceedings, and they apply by filing with an immigration judge at the Executive Office of Immigration Review, uh, and that's through the Department of Justice. Now, asylum is applied for because they don't want to be removed or as a defense from being removed from the U.S. So I am not a lawyer, just a disclaimer, <laughs> I'm not an immigration lawyer. So for more information about these different um, statuses or applications and things like that, it's best to consult with an accredited lawyer to have more information about that. Now, as far as proof of eligibility, in order for individuals to receive services through the different resettlement agencies, they must prove that they are eligible for services. So. There is an eligibility document that I have shared. If you can download it, it will provide you with basically what documents the resettlement agencies look at when an individual 
when, when an individual comes through their door and requests services. So for each individual, you might provide an I-94 or some type of documentation or letter based on your status, whether you're a refugee, asylee, a victim of trafficking. There are certain documents you must provide in order for us or the resettlement agencies. When I say us, I mean resettlement agencies, not the agencies mm -hmm. that I work for. So the agencies can um, work with you. Cool. So that's the top, the number one of your handout that says CRSP, uh, Chris, that's how we pronounce that, mm -hmm. eligibility documents. Yep. And if anyone has more questions about those eligibility, they can contact Susan Anderson, who is the state refugee coordinator. And her phone number is um, on the slide. And also her email, I believe, is on the co-branded flyer that we use to kind of like show what are the core services that the resettlement agencies provide. Great. All right. Now, some of the documents for asylees that we can use to um, as proof of eligibility is I, one of them is the I-94, which is a card or letter that is a proof of the individual status. So it shows when asylum was granted and it's, it is also used to get other services or documents or benefits and applying for benefits and it should not be modified. If there is an error, uh, people should um, reach out to a lawyer or talk to USCIS to see how the error can be fixed. And basically, um, the letter just shows the individual's name, alien number, uh, the country of origin, and where they were when they were granted asylum. Can uh, it looks like we have a question. Is this a good time to? Take okay. that. There. Okay, so to clarify, did you mention that affirmative applicants who are denied and remain in the U.S. as authorized indiv unauthorized individuals may apply for defensive yes. um, consideration? Mm -hmm. Yep. So if your application, when you apply affirmatively and it's denied, you can apply uh, through the defensive method so you won't be removed from the United States, from the U.S. Great. Thank you. Great question. Another document uh, is an asylum grant letter, and it shows also the date the asylum status was granted, so the final decision of the grant of asylum, and it's also used to get other services and documents and benefits. There is also an order from an immigration judge granting individual asylum, or there is a recommended approval that an individual can present to us and it is issued due to pending security check because sometimes they have to go to a vetting system. So if it's, in, if it's taking longer than usual, individuals may apply for permission to work. And once everything is clear, like the security check and the course or USA has didn't find anything um, on the individual, any um, felonies or crimes or anything like that, the recommended approval will be changed to a grant of asylum, so the final grant of asylum. And last but not least, there is the written decision from the Board of Immigration Appeals under Section 208 of the Immigration and Nationality Act. All right, a Social Security. So asylees may immediately apply for an, an unrestricted Social Security card once asylum has been granted. So they may be issued a Social Security card that has a stamp on it that says valid for work with DHS authorization only, which limits individuals from working because they don't have, unless they have a letter from DHS saying that they can work. So once um, everything is clear, they will be issued a regular social security card with their name and social security number, and they can utilize that one as to get work, to apply for work and get work. When you say DHS, do you mean Homeland Security or Human Services? <laughs> <laughs> Human services. Okay. Yes. Yep. <laughs> so the employment authorization document, EAD card, is a proof of identity and employment authorization, and it can be obtained within 180 days after individual filed for an asylum application. But sometimes it may take longer because we all know that there is a huge backlog in the course and USCIS, so it may take longer than 180 days for individuals to obtain the employment authorization card. Uh, it is valid for two years, so there is a date where it was issued, and there's a date also where it shows when the card expires. So individuals should try to make sure that 
before it expires, they apply for either a new document before it expires because you don't want to wait until the last minute to, to apply for it. Yeah, maybe with, um, as you mentioned, backlog and so forth, people should apply, reapply maybe 90 days in advance, do you think? or Possibly. It's best to consult with an attorney. They'll be able to okay. give them more details, yes. Now, asylees who are encountering difficulty, they may show the employers uh, the Department of Justice policy memorandum explaining that as an asylee, you are legally authorized to work without an EAD. So um, asylees who haven't received their EAD, they don't have to show this document to prove that they're legally allowed to work. So they can provide that letter saying that they're, um, so like an EAD is acceptable as a list A document for the I-9, and they can provide their um, I-94 and other documents proving their, their legal status here in the U.S. The Lawful Permanent Resident Card, also called Green Card, individuals may apply for it after 365 days, so roughly a year, uh, in the U.S. as an asylee. There is a medical exam that is required by the USCIS, and it has to be done by an approved doctor. Uh, also, there, is, there are civil surgeons and doctors that the USCIS provides. There are specific doctors that work with USCIS to be able to do that medical exam. On the USCIS website, there is a civil surgeon locator based on the area you live in. There are certain doctors you can go to and they will provide the medical exam. Now, certain acts may prevent individuals from, from getting their green card, and some of them include domestic violence, theft, child abuse, public benefit fraud, so lying on application and committing any type of fraud uh, relating to public benefits, traveling to home country or extended stay out of the country. So individuals should always try to contact with a rep reputable attorney or an, an accredited representative before leaving the country. Okay. Or if they, before they leave, determining how long they can stay outside of the country. That's really helpful because it might depend from a uh, case-to-case -case basis or what your home country is or which country you want it to go to. Is that right? Exactly. And also extended stay is vague. Yeah. Extended stay for one person could be, you know, a year, but maybe for USAIS it could be a couple months or a month. Who knows? So that's, that's why it's always important to consult with, with an attorney and they'll be able to help um, guide the individual and tell them how long they should stay out of the country and if they could go to their home country, which usually is not recommended to travel back to their home country, especially as a refugee on a tidy, because you're fleeing your home country to come here and resettle. So why would you want to go back to your home country? So it doesn't mean that it's safe. Do you need the refugee status? So it might just create problems with individuals and their application or their status here, or legal status here. That's Better be safe, I'm sorry. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. Now, when someone moves, they must notify USCIS within 10 days. An individual can do so by apply or completing the AR-11 form, which um, there's an elect electronic form or also there's a paper form. The electronic form can be found on the USCIS website. And it's just, you know, you complete it automatically then and there and then submit it. And it's free. The individual doesn't have to pay for it or the individual can print out the form that they get from the USCIS website and then fill it out and then send it and submit it. Uh, and if the individual already filed for the electronic form, they don't need to file for the paper form because they already submitted it. Also, individuals should notify the Department of Motor Vehicles about the change of address, uh, legal services, and also social services. So if they're working with an agency, make sure they let their caseworkers know or uh, at the Department of uh, Human Services, change their address there. Uh, if they're working, letting their employers know that they changed their address. Also U.S. Postal Services, doctors, just all those key uh, stakeholders that work with them, they should know um, about the address change. Now, as far as the asylee population in Colorado, we're going to talk about what it looks like, demographics, and also 
the society population in Colorado is also based on individuals served through um, the Colorado Refugee Services Programs um, agencies. Now, in the U.S., um, majority of the asylees are from China, surprisingly. 22% uh, of asylees in the U.S. are from China, then 11% from El Salvador, 10% from Guatemala, 7% from Honduras, 5% from Mexico, 4% from Egypt, 4% from Syria, 3% from Iraq, 2% from Nepal, and 2% from Ethiopia, and the rest are from other countries. So the rest of the asylees in the U.S. could be from countries like Sudan, um, Cuba, Haiti, Central African Republic, uh, just different countries that are not uh, listed here. So it's a group. If you want to have more details um, about those other countries, there is a link at the bottom of the slide, HTTPS that forward slash www.dhs.gov forward slash immigration dash statistics slash yearbook slash 2016. And in that link, um, there is more detailed information about the different countries. It's broken down also by the number of people from that country who have been granted asylum and so on and so forth. It's very detailed. I just couldn't put everything on the slide, but it provides um, a variety of information. I'm super impressed that you read that link out. Well, I haven't read it all the way, but just grabbed some of the information. It was interesting. You know, I could have spent a good two, three hours just going through the links and checking the, the data that they provided. Because to reiterate, um, and for folks who jumped on later, so having economic, for example, having major hardship in your home country, you know, you can't find a job, you cannot make things like that, that does not qualify a person for a asylum status, right? No, no. You have to have that. Persecution, remember the definition with the fear of persecution because of your political association, race, nationality, and so on and so forth. Those have to be a factor. Yeah. yeah. Now, when it comes to filing for affirmative filings, applicants from the countries of the Northern Triangle, which are El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras, have been key, key drivers in affirmative filing. So most of the affirmative filing come from individuals from those countries. And as we know right now with what's going on at the border, it probably will continue to be a key driver for those individuals who are applying for asylum. So those folks, when we see the pictures from the border in kind of that situation, those folks would all be affirmative filers, right? Because they haven't yet gone through the process to be ordered for removal. If there have not been, know. yes. If they have not been, yes. Okay. But if you turning in yourself and you're detained, you might be applying defensively so you won't be removed. From the U.S. Okay, I know that's a super complicated situation, it and is. there's a lot of questions around it. it. That's and helpful. There are a lot of also policies or things that are changing on a daily basis, so it's hard to keep up with, yeah. you know, everything overall that is going on. But luckily, we have lawyers who are on top of it and having all the information that they need and having any updates, either that are happening at border or in the federal level as far as what the um, President is issuing as far as laws and policies in regards to immigration and asylum seekers okay. and other populations so because you know some of the laws that are made are also affecting immigrants, not just asylum seekers. You know, so it's good to keep that in mind as well. Thank you. So as of 2016, um, the there was a downward trend as far as affirmative and defensive. Affirmative, I'm sorry, and defensive applications. And again, so for total, it was going down to 20,000 application or people have been granted asylum. Affirmatively, there are about 11, 12,000 individuals. And defensively, about 9,000 individuals as of 2016. And again, within the next year or two, we will see if the trend will be either going downwards or going back up because of what's going, the number of people we are receiving and right. how many are granted asylum or denied. Interesting. And the yearbook also, the DHS, like the link that I provided earlier, it has more details and breaks it down on like how many are granted asylum affirmatively and defensively, the country of origin, and so on and so forth. Great. So it's pretty... Um, like extensive information there. Good, good, good link. 
Now in Colorado, um, the Asahi population is a little bit different compared to the nationwide data. In Colorado, and I just wanted to make sure people are paying attention to the title. This data in, indicates the number of individuals served by CRISP, the Colorado Refugee Services Program, and the time frame is from October 2017 to January 2019. So these are the individuals who have been served through CRISP funded programs, not all the asylees in Colorado overall. So, and the time frame also from 2017 to 2019. So just basically 47 individuals from Ethiopia between 2017 and January 2019 have um, you know received services through CRISP funded programs, not 47 percent of societies. Okay. So I just want to make sure people were reading the graph um, properly. Also, 27 percent. I mean, 27 individuals from Eritrea, 17 individuals from Russia, and 15 from Venezuela, Syria, and Congo. Eight individuals. Now there are other countries too, but the numbers were lower. So two here, four here, five here for like. Sudan, Libya, Cuban, um, Basilis, and other coming from other countries. So I just didn't put that on the slide, but there are other countries that are represented too here in Colorado. So the question is trying to find if there are asylees here in the state that are not receiving services through CRISP funded programs. Okay. So the research, that's why the research is very important for the Asylee Irish Project to find that out. So I can do outreach where those individuals are located, whether it's in the Western Slope or Southern Colorado, to be able to share that information with them that once you're granted asylum or have a certain immigration status, you may be eligible for services and to contact the state um, representative and they will be placed with one of the resettlement agencies. Awesome, thank you. Now, based on those countries of origin, the languages that are spoken by asylees who are serving in Colorado are Amharic, 26 individuals, Tigrinya, 28, Russian, 21, Spanish, 19, and Spanish, it could be from people from Venezuela, Guatemala, Cuba, and Colombia, Oromo, people from Ethiopia, Arabic for people from Syria, Sudan, Libya, or Iraq. Now, for services provided and how to access them, individuals can access services and benefits once they are placed with a resettlement agency. Now, the Colorado Refugee Services Program is a program within the Colorado Department of Human Services, and they help fund programs that serve Office of Refugee and Resettlement Eligible Populations, so the OR eligible populations. Now, all our benefits and services are eligible, are available to eligible population with required documents. So that eligibility desk that I provided earlier, so agencies refer to that um, document to be able to determine whether the individual is eligible for services or not. And the OR uh, population are refugees, asylees, Cuban, Haitian entrants, Iraqi and Afghan special immigrant visa holders. They're also victims of trafficking and immigration. So and individuals who fall in these categories, they may be eligible for services for up to five years. Now, also individuals who move to Colorado from another state, um, if they are a refugee or an asylee, they still may be eligible for CRIS funded services and benefits. If they've been in the US years. less than five years. Like, up to, so once yeah. they granted that status, or let's say an asylee, once they granted that status, they're eligible, they may be eligible for services for up to five years. So say they lived in Ohio for two years and now they've come to Colorado, they may have three years yep. of eligibility for services remaining. Correct. Yep. Great. But then that the services that they may be eligible for have to be determined by the agency that they're working with. So they will apply for, let's say, if, you need, if the individual needs um, food stamp or certain um, public benefits, the agency will help the individual apply for those benefits and then eligibility will be determined by the Department of Human Services and they will let the individual know if they're still eligible for food stamps or other benefits. So it's all, they may be eligible for it. So that's another key thing too. Okay. It's not because you have a certain status that you automatically qualify to receive those services. You have to apply for it and 
their uh, qualification and criteria that DHS goes by before um, approving the application. So for the, as far as the resettlement agencies here in Colorado, um, there are the Lutheran Family Services Rocky Mountain, which is located in the Metro Denver, Colorado Springs, and Greeley area. There's the International Rescue Committee, which is in Lakewood, and the African Community Center in Denver. Now, resettlement agencies can connect individuals to services, and eligible po population can also access those services, such as um, ESL, so English as a Second Language, vocational training, or they can connect with ESL providers on their own. So asylees don't have to come to, let's say, African Community Center to be able to go to an ESL class. They can go directly to an institution or an agency that provides ESL classes and register on their own. Great. Yeah. Also, uh, resettlement agencies can serve individuals statewide. So if an individual is outside of the Denver Metro, resettlement agencies can still provide um, services to them regardless of location and residence for up to five years after the date of eligibility. So just like we mentioned earlier, so after you receive status, you individuals may be eligible for services for up to five years. Any questions? Yeah, no questions. Oh, yep. Okay. Somebody, somebody's got a question for us. Yay. No, we're um, in a second. Technical difficulties, and by technical difficulties, I mean I didn't answer, open the right box. Okay, are U visa holders and el eligible pop in for services? So if I understand the question, if you have a U visa, can you also go to one of these agencies and um, you know ask for assistance with job training or English or so forth? Is a U visa for a victim of trafficking, I believe, or? Yeah, you, uh, T visa is trafficking. U visa is a, a domestic violence. So it right? has to be victim yeah. of trafficking. So the or eligible people, like I mentioned earlier, have to be refugee, an asylee, the Iraqi or Afghan special immigrant visa holder, a victim of trafficking, certain Amerasian from Vietnam, also Cuban or Haitian entrant parolee. So those individuals are the one who are our eligible population for services. Okay, looks like Susan jumped on to help us out too. Thank you, Susan. Um, the answer is no for the U visa unless you are an unaccompanied refugee minor. But in the instance you had a client who fit that, um, you would go ahead and contact the state. Um, that's Susan's number is, was on the previous slide and also in the handouts in your chat box. Um, and for anyone who's not familiar with our special immigrant visa holders or SIVs, those are the folks who helped our military as kind of cultural guides and also interpreters during the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan and are uh, no longer safe there consequently. Correct. Yeah. And thank you, Susan, for jumping in and confirming. Thank you. So resettlement agencies can help with the following case management services. And there is a flyer that I provided, which also kind of provide the core services that the resettlement agencies provide. So case management, health, employment, and ESL, income and family um, support. Great. So case management, employment services, so help an individual with vocational training, receiving certain certification, evaluating certain transcripts. So if they bring their transcripts from their home countries, we can help. We, again, resettlement agencies mm -hmm. can help. Um, you know, finding agencies that can help tr uh, do the transcript evaluation. ESL classes, which I mentioned earlier, and again, they don't, individuals don't necessarily have to come to the resettlement agency to access EL ESL classes. They can access health services, including health screening and also connecting to pri primary care providers. There are services to youth and older adults, potential cash assistance to eligible clients, Immigration legal services, so when the agency has legal services in-house, they may have access to those services. If not, the resettlement agency is able to um, refer the individual to partner agencies in the community so they can receive um, immigration and legal support. We are also able to connect individuals to volunteers and mentors if needed, education classes on different topics like cultural orientation, just educating individuals and helping them 
and giving them the tools to integrate in this new community that they're living in. Also, there are psychosocial support groups to help individuals just with their main need, mental support and family support services. Now, as far as public benefit, uh, each program has income and resource eligibility requirements. So there are requirements. So if the individual meets the requirements, they will be eligible. They may be eligible for services. And if they don't meet the eligibility requirements, that's when they are not able to receive those, um, those benefits. So the resettlement agencies work closely with county human service departments to assist with enrollment to, to those different programs. So those programs are food with the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, the SNAP program, so individuals can receive food stamps and ability to help with providing them with food. WIC, Women, Infant, and Children, uh, is a program for healthy food to pregnant women, new moms, and kids under five years of age. There's health coverage, uh, like Health First Colorado, which is the Colorado Medicaid program here that we have. And it provides free or low-cost health benefits to adults, kids, pregnant women, and seniors, as well as people with disabilities. Um, there's also CHIP, the Children Health Insurance Program, which provides free or low-cost medical and dental care for individuals who are insured and for kids up to 19. Uh, now, if an individual doesn't qualify for public medical assistance program, they should talk to their agency for additional information about health coverage options. And as we all know, the health care system here is, it can be very difficult. Even yeah. for people who've been, who are born and raised here, it's hard to understand how certain things work. So it's good to have those agencies or refer to the agencies and they'll be able to either provide a training or just help navigate the health care system to be able to receive health care benefits. Awesome. And, and they can, uh... Can an asylum seeker, or a sub, someone who's rather been granted asylum, excuse me, do they have to go through one of the resettlement agencies to get services, or can they, I think you said they can individually go out and find an English class on their own if they would like to, and so forth. Yes, so there is, yes, they can go on their own and apply, even for these benefits. However, if you have an agency that can help you and help hold you in or walk by your side and help you access all the services, would you rather do that or just do it on your own? You know what sure. I mean? If the if the service is there, why not use it? Definitely. You know what I mean? We have another um, question too. We're loving the questions, guys. Can you read that or down there? Okay. What if any kind of services do the Colorado resettlement agencies provide to asylum seekers before they get their asylum status? If not, can we change that? It can take a long time, years even, to get a final decision. Yes, that's very true. It can take a long time. Now, unfortunately, because of the funding that the resettlement agencies receive, we cannot provide those sub-services to asylum seekers. However, each agency, each resettlement agency may have a program or some type of funding that is not state funding or um, government funding that they can utilize to provide services for asylum seekers. Yeah, that makes sense. I think if you're working with someone, you know, contact one of those agencies because they may mm -hmm. know of another more community-based agency that can help. Correct. Yes, there are definitely some um, community organization, churches, individuals who just want to help asylum seekers, whether it's with transportation, English classes, uh, financial resources, or just lawyers, pro the lawyers that provide pro bono services. So it's, it's good to reach out to, to the different agencies that provide um, services to asylum seekers because, like you said, the process can take years before getting a financial decision. And, you know, it's hard to not be able to work or do certain things when you don't have any resources or you are undocumented or, you know, just waiting for some type of answers. So definitely consult with, um, you know, just calling the resettlement agencies or researching the agencies or groups, community groups that are in the community that can help asylum seekers. And I would pitch as well, if you're a victim advocate in the community-based agency, you know, folks have sometimes been through a lot, of course, as we know, by the time they've gotten here. So they may be crime victims under Colorado law, and they may not really be recognizing that or identifying themselves as such, because it might not be the worst thing that's, you know, happened to them in the last six months a year, year or what have you. And so, you know, always uh, 
definitely want you to feel free <clears throat> to help folks understand and navigate the path you know to law enforcement and beyond if that's something that we've discovered and they decide that they you know feel safe and want to report all right okay thank you for that all right that was our questions for the moment we'll move forward all right. Now, other benefits. There are housing benefits that individuals can apply for, subsidized housing, receiving housing vouchers to be able to pay for rent. Um, there are also helpful low-income families to get into affordable housing or government-owned rental housing, so which is really nice because we all have to have a place to live, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's the Low Income Home Energy Assistance Program, the LEAP program, which helps low-income households pay for heating and cooling bills and offers also low-cost home improvements if individuals need it. There's financial assistance under the TANF program, the temporary assistance for needy families, and there's also supplemental security income, which provides cash to low-income seniors as well as adults and kids with disabilities. So as you may see, some of these programs or benefits, they are really time-sensitive because individuals can only be on it for a certain amount of time. So the sooner individuals um, tap into those resources or benefits, the better it is so they can take advantage of like the full, let's say, eight months worth of ben receiving benefits or the full year of receiving benefits instead of just receiving three months of benefits because they didn't know that they were eligible for benefits and services. We've got another question. We're loving it. As a rural service provider, or rather as a service provider in a rural area, how does case management work to asylees outside of the Denver metro area? Yeah. So the resettlement agencies will work directly with those individuals, and they'll be able to either, like I'm not in that one-on-one -on -one area where I work directly with asylees, but I know since we provide uh, services statewide, the resettlement agency will make sure that they connect with those individuals. And if there are services that can be provided in those remote and rural areas, the individual will be referred to that agency or service provider in that area. Great question, Megan, thank you. All right, public benefit. I know it's been a lot of question. I get this question about public charge and how public benefits affect individual, um, individuals who, are, who have big cases, still waiting and things like that. But receiving public benefits will not affect the OR eligible population case unless they commit fraud. So again, doing anything criminal activity or committing fraud would definitely affect people's cases because it could be used as you know a way of determining the person's mor good moral character and saying that if someone is committing fraud, they're not you know deserving or receiving certain certain status. So some examples could be financial um, information, providing false information about financial status or situation, claiming a certain number of dependents that the person doesn't have, or using uh, different names or other people's identity. And I know there's also some stigmatization about friends and family who receive public benefits, but individuals should still try to apply for citizenship or green card or family petition if they need it if they are receiving public benefits. The key thing is not committing any type of crime because that could affect the person's case or application. For health services, resettlement agencies can help or eligible population connect to primary care providers. They can help uh, individuals get their free refugee health screening at community-based health care centers, which includes um, things like full physical exam, lab work, TB tests, emotional health assessment, immunization, and also referral to more care as needed. So if the individual needs more of, let's say the individual has an acute illness or disease, uh, the resettlement agency will be able to help refer the individual to like a specialist so they can, they can receive the service that they need. As far as employment, uh, the, resettlement, the resettlement agencies can help with job search, filling out application, preparing for an interview or application assistance. It can also help to, with tuition assistance and scholarships, transcript evaluation, which I mentioned earlier, placing individuals in, jo in jobs and following up. So it's not just a matter of finding a job for someone and leaving them there. There's also the follow-up because we have to make sure that the individual is doing okay at the job, there's no issues between the employer and the employee, 
and making sure that the communication, whatever the employer is trying to communicate to the employee, the employee is understanding what is going on. So they won't get in trouble and lose their job, which again will affect their whole livelihood. Employment upgrades can help individuals who want to upgrade their job and get higher pay, for example. We can help with providing that service, career pathway coaching, training and coaching programs to reconnect to past careers. So some individuals come to the U.S. Um, as teachers or individuals who are in the pharmaceutical industry, PhDs with different, different degrees. So if the individual wants to get back to that career, Unfortunately, sometimes a degree is not um, recognized here in the U.S., so we will help individual get back to the area of study that they need to get back to, or if they want to switch and get into another career, we will help so the employment team help uh, the individual connect, do take the right training, get the right education to be able to get to, to accomplish their goal, achieve their goal. So the main key is having those goals laid out and goals coming from the individuals, not goals coming from the resettlement agencies, because we want to promote um, self-sufficiency. We want to promote the individual having goals set in place and us as a resettlement agencies, helping the individual integrate and accomplish this, those goals and also sustainability. You know, it's good to accomplish these goals, but how about sustainability? We want to make sure that individual can maintain even if the resettlement agency is not in the picture anymore. Perfect. We, like, um, um, as far as ESL classes, I mentioned it earlier again, individuals can directly go to institutions that provide ESL classes without a referral. There is in-home tutoring that may be available in some areas for individuals who are unable to attend class because of illness or maybe because of childcare and things like that depending on the agency and the availability, uh, in-home tutoring could be an option. We assist individuals um, who want to place their kids in public schooling. So we want to make sure that kids, if the client has goals to have their kids go to school, we help them in that manner by filing the application, providing support and assistance, trying to determine which is the best school to take their kids to. Also, individuals who are granted asylum are eligible for in-state tuition at public universities immediately upon arrival. So once the individual is granted status, they um, are eligible for in-state tuition, which is really nice um, because having to pay out-of-state tuition, it's really, really expensive. Yeah, that's a tough one. It is, yes. So certain foreign nationals who are legally settled here can or, you know, they fall into that. Now, the Family Unification Program, also called the P3AR, the Affidavit of Relationship Program, resettlement agencies can help file this Affidavit of Relationship, and the qualifying members includes parents, spouse, and married children under 21. Now, the relatives must be outside of the country of origin, and it's only limited to certain nationalities. And it's limited to certain nationalities because of um, the list of travel ban countries that we had. So if individuals are from those countries that are part of that country list, unfortunately, it's not going, you know, we won't be able to file for this application. Um, the individual must file within five years of date granted asylum, and also the relationship has to exist at the time of the asylum interview. Resettlement agencies may not charge a fee, but there may be a DNA um, fee that is required to be, a to be able to determine the relationship with the DNA test. And once the DNA test is confirmed and the relationship is confirmed, the individual may be reimbursed. So no getting married real quick. Boys, <laughs> you can just run off and get married real quick, and before your interview, that's that was an old movie, but not so much, huh? Right. <laughs> and also, this application gives family members access to the refu U.S. refugee interview for them to go through the process. The next one is the family unif the I seven thirty application. This one, immigration partners help file this application, and eligible relationship will include spouse and unmarried children under twenty one. 
Now, for this one also, the relative may be inside or outside of the country of origin, and they could also be in the U.S. or abroad. So those are some criteria. Um, the individual must file within two years of grant of asylum, and the relationship had to exist at the time of the asylum interview. There is no filing fee, but the partner agency that is filing the application may charge a fee. Now, once granted, um, once the application is granted, the spouse or children receive asylum status, whether they are in the U.S. or in another country. And the spouse and children will qualify once they granted that status. They may be eligible for certain benefits once they in the U.S. Now, it's always important and crucial to talk to an attorney, and an accredited attorney, to make sure that not only the application is filed properly, but also to get guidance and coaching and going through interviews, just knowing how to talk to officers and how to answer certain questions. So those lawyers who are accredited and are doing the work know how to navigate the system. Perfect. Now, legal representation um, is not required, uh, but immigration matters and processes, it's important to have those lawyers present working with individuals because they know, again, they know the system, they know the application, they know the cases, and they are able to really work with the individual and get successful rates because you are more likely to have your application approved if you have a lawyer when when you don't. Okay. So having a lawyer is really crucial, even if it's for simple things. Having the legal representation and legal help is very important. To contact USCIS, uh, there's a website, www.uscis.gov. And on that website, individuals can find all sorts of information, different forms to, you know, individual wants to apply for, they can find the forms there and it's free to download and print out. And if individual wants to um, go to a USCIS office, they'll have to schedule an, an appointment at the InfoPass, www.infopass.uscis.gov. And they have different languages available. However, I know that recently, um, because I personally was trying to get an InfoPass appointment, and when I went on the site, it's saying that they are not taking appointments right now. So you have to call the customer service and customer service, USCIS customer service, and they will um, kind of like start a, a service request. And once they start that service request, and they said that it may take anywhere between 24 hours to 72 hours to have someone call you back and schedule an appointment. Okay, so they're yeah. really backed up right now. They are backed up. They are backed up. So the one at least here in Denver, in Centennial, that office, that's what it said. Because I personally went on there, and um, that's what it said on the site. And when I talked to the customer service representative at USCIS, that's what they said. Now, some of the challenges that um, the societies are faced with, it's, it's numerous challenges. Uh, but these are just a few that I put on the slide, and they include language barriers because not everybody speaks English when they come to the U.S., so that could be a barrier as far as communicating with other people, whether it's Border Patrol people or con communicating with a lawyer or just people who are trying to help, so that could be a challenge. Uh, family members being separated, very huge, huge, huge um Barrier. I mean, it's a challenge, and it's really sad that families have to be separated while they're waiting for the cases to be heard. There's also detention while the case is pending and possible removal. So just having that fear of being removed from a country that you're coming to to seek asylum, it's it's very it's very um, challenging. There's also uncertainty uncertainty because of employment, education, housing, transportation trauma recovery, among many other things. Also, the fact that individuals have limited resources to get a lawyer and other services. Not all, all lawyers are providing pro bono services. And as we may know that uh, legal services is not always cheap and all, but it's good to have those agencies um, that provide either pro bono services or low cost services to help these individuals with their cases. Now, how you guys can help is by referring um, individuals that you may work with or know of 
to the Colorado Refugee Services Program's coordinator, Susan Anderson, and her email and phone number are on this slide as well as on the flyer that I provided on the links there. So if you, let's say you know of an asylum, somebody who's just been granted asylum, the best thing you can do to help them is refer them to Susan. And from there, Susan will refer the individual to either African Community Center, Lutheran Family Services, or International Rescue Committee. Trying to find what their needs are. And if you can help, help them. If not, again, do the referral process. And if you can provide assistance with understanding their rights, not only as human beings, but also as uh, immigrants and having a legal status here in the U.S. Providing interpretation services if or when needed. Again, we know that language could be a barrier. So having, making sure that the individual knows what's going on and knows about benefits and services and understanding that is, is crucial as well. Building bridges and links between different service providers to improve efficiency and efficacy of services provided to society. So we want to make sure that we know what agencies, community groups, uh, institutions are in the area. So if a service is not provided in-house within the resettlement agency, we're able to refer the person to that institution or organization that provides the service that is needed. Because we want to make sure we all know what's going on to make that referral process easier. And building those relationships and maintaining those relationships as well, too. Volunteering with organizations that provide services to asylees, donating to those agencies, providing pro bono services when possible, and also participating in policy making by advocating for asylees and other population because you can make a whole lot of changes when the policies are just like that. So there's some change that needs to be made and with policy changes that will help, um, you know, just making those laws more um, immigrant friendly to help those populations. So that's all I have for you all. If you have any questions, comments, it will be helpful to, you know, start now. Mm -hmm. Can I have another, what, how long do we have? Well, we just, technically we have three minutes, so understand if anybody needs to drop off and get back to your day, we'll, we'll still be here. And if you are going to uh, drop off and get back to your day, a reminder that the email you receive uh, from me after the webinar is your proof of attendance. If you need, uh, like, a, you know, for certification purposes, um, keep that showing your one-hour attendance that the webinar will be available on COVA's YouTube channel, COVA 789, I believe is our handle, if you will. <clears throat> and that to before you go, download any or all of the four handouts as that uh, is the way that they're available. Um, and if you could respond with the answer the survey that you get in the follow-up email, of course, that will help us refine the presentation. So with that, yeah, we'll take questions. I was going to say that survey also is really crucial because it helps us better understand what's going on statewide as far as agencies that are here in Colorado, especially in those remote areas. If you work in the southern area or in the western slopes, knowing what agency are locally there and working with immigrant population or possibly asylum seekers, that will be helpful. Uh, understanding the demographics, who is here, from what country, um, age group also sex, just trying to help us better understand the population and also um, just determining how we can all work together, knowing that we can refer individuals to other agencies that are in the area is really, really important. So if you could definitely please answer the questionnaire, it would really help us a lot. And thank you in advance. Awesome. Yeah, that's, um, you can always just send me an email to Kirsten at ColoradoCrimeVictims.org, and that's in the GoToWebinar um, section if you have a question. If you are seeing asylum seekers and you're in a, you know, more rural part of the state um, and you've got your, uh, the name of your agency, yeah, we may not be aware that you're even helping these folks. Right. All right. And I'm also available to do presentations, in-person presentation at your agency. If you feel like there's a need for me to come, I can come. At, I will travel to your location and do a presentation for individuals who want to learn more and also sharing the flyer. Please share the flyer, which has also the services and benefits that individuals may be eligible for. 
and also the contact person. And actually, let me type, can I type in your email and send it out sure. to everybody mm -hmm. in the question pane? So can you? N D E Y E uh -huh. dot N D A O at rescue dot O R G. That's an easy one. Mm -hmm. So I'm sending and they, uh, sorry, and Dave's uh, email address out to everyone. And I've got a question. What are some examples of organizations in the Denver area that are serving asylum seekers? Yeah, so the Village Exchange Center has um, a book that has like resources for asylum seekers and also other immigrant population. So if you could, con I don't know if you ever heard of the Village Exchange Center. I can share possibly their link, or if you Google Village Exchange Center, they have a huge um, resource list for individuals who need asylum seekers and others. Okay. Um, United Way 211? Yes, 211 is another resource calling the 211 number. Okay. Um, we've got somebody who lets know they're having difficulty downloading the documents. I'm sorry about that. I wonder if it's the size of them. I blame everything on GoToWebinar. Will these be available in a different location or can they be emailed to the participants on the call? Yeah, we'll make that work out, Andrea. Um, if anyone else is still on and wants to let me know if they were not able to download them, um, maybe I'll have to send them one at a time or something. So yeah, thanks for letting me know that. All right, any other questions? Yeah, if anyone else has tried to download the document and can't, let me know. Um, yeah, like I said, maybe your spam, maybe something to do with the spam filter doesn't uh, like it or whatnot. Um, yep, we've got, a, we've got a question wanting to connect Susan with somebody and we'll go ahead and do that offline. Somebody else letting me know that they were able to download. Oh, okay. Cool. Good. Okay, Andrea, we'll get those to you. Rocky Mountain Welcome Seeker, Rocky Mountain Welcome Center can also connect asylum seekers with resources. Yes, they are, I believe they have like ASL program and other resources that they can um, refer asylum seekers to as well. Yeah, and additionally, the three resettlement uh, agencies that they mentioned, African Community Center, Lutheran, uh, sir, family, Lutheran Refugee Services, Lutheran Rocky, family, service. family Services, Rocky, Rocky Mountain, Mountain. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, and IRC, International Rescue Committee. Excellent. All right, any other questions or comments that folks want to throw out to help us all network? Well, thank you all so much for attending this webinar. It really means a lot, and I really appreciate your support. And please help share the word about the services and benefits that societies and other populations may be eligible for. All right. Thanks very much, everyone. Enjoy your day. Bye.